Well, good morning and welcome to church. We are so happy to see each and every one of you with us this morning. And whether you're in the worship center or whether you're watching online this morning, this is our opportunity to lift up our voices, lift up our hands, lift up our praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came. He died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is what he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, he beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God. This is what he does. He says. 
tell you this morning that one of the most important things you'll hold on to in your life is to hold on to your praise. Never give up your praise because your praise will carry you through the darkest times of life. Your praise will carry you through the deepest pits of life, the most challenging moments that you will ever go through in life. It's not the circumstances changing that will get you through, although that's a blessing. But what will get you through anything in life is to continue to keep your praise going to God. And by the way, we have so many things to praise Him for. Is that not true? He's been so good to us. He's a good God. And some people, 
Some people think of the Christian life sort of as a buffet. I'll come and take this, and I don't really like that praise thing, so I'll leave that there aside. You can't leave it aside. It's an essential part of your spiritual journey. All through the Psalms, praise the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, bless His holy name. Actually, the very word itself, hallelujah, means praise ye the Lord. That's the exact meaning of that word this morning. So I want you, just as I pray together today, that out of your own voice, out of your own voice, your own words, your own innermost being, for you today to bring your praise to God. I know that we've done it in song, but now let's do it in word together as I lead us together in prayer. Lord, we come before you this morning and we offer to you our worship and our praise and our adoration. Lord, we come to, to, today to speak out our praise of you, our gratitude to you for all the tremendous things you've done in our lives. And Father, we come this morning realizing that, Lord, praise is the pathway to breakthrough. The Lord, there's some here today that need a breakthrough in their life. They need something to change, something to move. They need some walls to come down. And Lord, we thank you that you've established praise to be a point of breakthrough in our lives. So Lord, as we worship you, you work in us and you work around us. So Lord, we bring to you our best worship, our best praise, our adoration, our gratitude today for all that you are. And Father, I pray that even as we're worshiping you, that you would come in your grace and power and minister to every heart, minister to every life today, heal those that are sick, restore those who need to be restored today, give encouragement to that one that needs to be encouraged, give strength to the weak today, God. I pray that in this place today that we will know that we've met with our God and that God, if God be for us, no one can be against us. You're our strength, you're our power, you're our victor, you're our savior, you're our deliverer, and we worship and honor you in Jesus' name. And all the church together said amen and amen. Come on, give him your best praise this morning. Lord, we praise you. Come on, out of your heart, Lord, we worship you today. We glorify and honor you, Jesus. We magnify your great name. Aren't you glad to be in church this afternoon? Aren't you glad to be together in God's house? Why don't you take a moment, say hi to some people around you, then you can be seated. Great to see everybody here today. It's so good to be in church this morning. Good to have you with us. If you're with us today for the very first time, we're especially glad to have you with us. Why don't we give a good round of applause to those with us for the first time today. Welcome to church. Do us a favor, if you will. If this is your first time with us, would you please grab this little bulletin you received on the way in? You're going to see at the bottom section, there's a little QR code. Go ahead and grab your phone right now and scan that QR code. It's going to open up a connection here with us and provide us an opportunity to actually give you a gift in celebration of you being with us this weekend. Just a quick reminder to stay up to all, with all the activities here at the church. Very simple. All you do is go to church-redeemer.org slash info. Very simple. Church-redeemer.org slash info. Make sure you stay up with all that's going on in church life. If you haven't downloaded our church app yet, make sure that you do that. The My M-Y-C-O-R app. And get that on your phone or your mobile device. Again, that's a way to stay up with all the activities and all the resources here at our church. For a few other announcements, let's take a look at the screens and watch this together. Hello everyone, welcome to Church of the Redeemer. My name is Joe. And I'm Fran, and we have a few announcements to share with you, so let's jump in. As followers of Jesus, we are instructed by Jesus to be baptized. Yes, it is one of the ways we externally express an internal decision we've made to follow Christ. And if you're ready to follow Jesus' footsteps, sign up today at church-redeemer.org slash info. Baptisms will be held Saturday, April 27th after the 6 p.m. service in Gaithersburg and Sunday, April 28th after the 11 a.m. service in Frederick and after the 1 p.m. service in Gaithersburg. We cannot wait to celebrate the life you now have in Christ. Fran, have you ever taken Living Stones? Yeah, I actually have. And it was a great way to learn more about Redeemer and ways that I could partner with the church in order to move God's mission forward. That's so cool. For me, it was learning about how the church started and the core values that we hold as a church. That's awesome. I would 10 out of 10 recommend. If you've never taken Living Stones, this is your next step in getting even more involved here at Redeemer. Living Stones is a three-week class, and our next class will take place the first three Sundays of May at the Gaithersburg campus. You can register by visiting church-redeemer.org slash info. 
Go trips are here and I'm so excited because I'm going on my very first go trip this year and I know it's gonna be life changing. As someone who's went on one, I can definitely tell you that it's gonna be for sure. We have a go trip for you. It's coming up in October of this year. You will be part of loving and serving those in need and will grow yourself. The registration deadline is April 30th, so don't wait. You can find all the information you need at church-redeemer.org slash info. We cannot wait to see how God uses you as, as you, you go. go. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We also want to say thank you for your consistent giving. You make Redeemer possible. If you would like to support Redeemer today, you can give at church-redeemer.org slash give. We are so glad you are with us and hope you will stick around with us all the way through our Family Matters series. That's 
together. Lord, thank you that you never fail us, that you're a God that we can put our absolute confidence in, our trust in. We can throw all of our weight over on you because you never, ever fail us. And thank you that you've given us the precepts and the promises of your word that we can live by, that we can build our lives around. I pray this morning as we study your word, as we take time to reflect on what you would speak to us today, we ask that our hearts and minds would be open to you. Lord, we pray that all distractions that might pull our attention away from what the Holy Spirit is saying to us today would be eradicated from us even in this moment. Let our attention be fully directed toward you. Speak to us today, O oh God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we thank our worship team for leading us in worship this morning? Just a couple things I do want to remind. First of all, let's welcome our Frederick campus this morning. Good morning to all the folks in Frederick this morning. Great to have you here. I think you can do better than that. Give a good welcome to Frederick today. Good to have everybody here in worship together. Those that are joining us online as well, welcome to church. And just a couple things I do want to mention. You heard on the screen a moment ago. Let me just highlight them for you again just for a moment. Uh, don't forget that baptism happens at the end of this month. If you haven't been baptized since becoming a follower of Jesus, uh, this is the time to do it. Uh, take that step in your journey. You'll be uh, so glad that you did. It's a key part of your spiritual journey, your walk with God. Also, you saw mentioned an upcoming Go Trip. Uh, this coming October, we're going to South America, to Peru. Uh, actually going into the jungle of Peru and Iquitos and uh, doing some work there, some construction work, ministry work, a variety of things with our sister church there in South America. And I'd love to have you participate in that, uh, especially need some men to be a part of this as well. If God's calling you to be a part of it, sign up, go to our website at church-redeemer.org slash info. And the deadline for that trip, by the way, because we have to make plans and get all the tickets in line for that, will be the end of this month, the 30th of April. So uh, you got a week or two uh, way to think about that, but I would encourage you to be a part of that as well. Well, today we continue our series together entitled Family Matters. I want to talk to you today about showing respect, and this is going to be a two-part message uh, and, and the bigger series that we have. I do want to encourage you to stay with me through the entire series. As I told you to begin with, this is actually a free marriage and family seminar right for you. And so uh, it's been beneficial to your life in many different ways. It not only relates to our marriages and families, but to every relationship in life. Whether you're married or single, there are things here for you and I to apply to all relationships of life. The reason that I'm focusing on families is because families are the center building block of society. The basic building block. When a family or families are destroyed in a culture, the culture is destroyed. I believe that one of the sad things we see in our world today is the destruction, the dissolution of the family unit. And our families need to be made stronger by God's word. Strong families build strong churches. Strong churches build a strong society. And a strong society makes an impact upon the world for the sake of God's kingdom. Now, the most obvious thing that is needed in a family, and any relationship for that matter, friendships as well, as we all are looking for and longing for one thing, there's one basic thing that all of us really want more than anything else. 
And that one thing is a four-letter word, L-O-V-E. What is that? Love. All of us want to be loved. We want to have a relationship, an environment where we actually are experiencing this thing called love. And our culture, our society, the media has over the years succeeded in, in sort of distorting the idea of love. They presented love to us as a feeling, something you get sort of goosebumps with and you have a quiver in your liver and you have all these different feelings that you have when you're in love with somebody. But the Bible doesn't teach us that kind of love. The Bible teaches us that love, the right kind of love, the God kind of love actually has really very little to do with your feelings. It has everything to do with your actions and your attitudes. And you can love even though you don't feel warm towards someone. And that's why we see very clearly in Scripture over and over again, we're called to be loving people. And one of the aspects of love, as we're going to see today, is this, this concept and experience and practice of something called respect. Let's define love based upon the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient and kind. So it's telling us, the real definition of love. By the way, this is the God kind of love, this Greek word, one of four Greek words that is often translated love. This is the word agape, and this is the God kind of love. Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous. It is not brag. It is not proud. It is not, what's this word here? Rude. I'll come back to that in a moment. It is not rude. It is not selfish, and it cannot be made angry easily. Love does not remember wrongs done against it. Love is never happy when others do wrong, but is always happy with the truth. Love never gives up on people. It never stops trusting, never loses hope, and never quits. There's so many things that we could talk about and will talk about in this series based upon this particular uh, biblical definition of love. But what, part of what I want you to see here in this concept, this Bible concept of love, is that there's something implied here. And what is implied is that love is always presenting itself in an attitude of the key word for this week and next week is what? Respect. It is not rude is what the Bible says. Love is not rude. Rudeness is the opposite of respectfulness. Sadly, we're living in a world today that is extremely rude. Ridiculously rude. I believe that social media has contributed to this because on social media you can basically say whatever you want to say and feel no consequences for it. And so people get on social media and they blab about this and that and the other thing and hurt people and never think about what they're saying or the impact or the consequences of it. We're living today in a very rude world all the way around. And rudeness is the opposite of respect. Rudeness is actually disrespect. What is respect? Respect really is the idea of esteeming other people, treating other people in a way that is appropriate, showing honor and deference to someone else, showing care and concern for someone. That's the idea of respectful behavior, respectful attitudes. It is realizing that I, I really want to communicate that I care about this other person, not demeaning, not in ways that are dishonoring or, again, disrespectful to them. Now, this call to respect is implied, obviously, in this passage, but in other passages, it's very specifically spoken of in very clear ways. Let me take you to Matthew chapter 7, and let's see what Jesus said about this concept of how we are to treat one another. This is called the golden rule. You perhaps know it as that. So in everything, do in everything, in how many things? Everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So Jesus said, how you want to be treated is the way that you should treat someone else. I would venture to submit today that all of us want to be respected. Is that true? You want people to treat you with respect. I certainly do. I believe that you do as well. So the Bible says that I am to treat you the way I want you to treat me. Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse number 10, says, be devoted to each other like a loving family. This is our series, Family Matters. And then please notice the statement, excel in showing what? Excel in showing respect for each other. So Paul says, when it comes to showing respect for each other, the letter grade of a C is not good enough. That's average. And a letter grade of B is not good enough. That might be above average. And a letter grade of A really isn't good enough. 
because I want you to actually excel in showing respect. I want you to get a letter grade of A plus when it comes to showing respect for others, not just a, a C or a B or an A, but an A plus. Excel in showing respect for each other. Let's take a look closer at the family just for a moment in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. However, it's talking to husbands and wives here. However, each man, each husband among you must, among you without exception, is to love his wife as his very own self with behavior worthy of respect and esteem, always seeking the best for her with an attitude of loving kindness. And so husbands, God says, here's the call to you and me, that we're to love our wives, as it goes on in another passage to say, as Christ loved the church, that we're to love our wives, and part of the way that we demonstrate this love for God is with behavior that is worthy of, what, earning their respect and esteem, always seeking the best. Now, by the way, ladies, you're not off the hook, because the passage goes on. And the wife must see to it, make sure that she does what? She, there's that word again, she respects and delights in her husband. That she shows, she, she notices him and prefers him and treats him with loving concern, treasuring him, honoring him, and holding him dear. And so we see when it comes to husband to wife, there needs to be love and respect. When it comes from wife to husband, there needs to be love and respect. So the home environment needs to be in the marriage relationship centered around uh, respect. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Get an A plus in showing everyone respect when it comes to the home. Because, by the way, sometimes our homes is where we're most disrespectful. Sometimes our homes are the places that we're not the nicest. And so God brings to us this perspective, especially in a marriage relationship. How about kids? Are kids included in this? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Same book, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, I'm reading from God's Word translation. Children, obey your parents because you're Christians. This is the right thing to do. Honor. Honor speaks of respect. Your father and mother, that everything may go well with you and you may have a long life on earth. This is an important command and promise. So the promise is, if you honor, respect your mother and father, you're promised to long life. There's a dimension of life promised to you. It's an important command with a promise. And then it goes on to say, fathers, do not make your children bitter about life. Instead, bring them up in Christian discipline and instruction. So I want you to see that Jesus said, treat everybody the way you want to be treated. You want respect. Treat people with respect. Make sure that you get an A plus in showing respect. Husbands, make sure that you respect your wife. And wives, make sure you're respecting your husbands. And children, make sure you respect your parents. And parents, treat your children even with respect. So I would, I would see from these passages that respect's pretty important in the home. Would you agree with me? Amen. It's important in every relationship in life. So you can't love well without learning how to practice Respect. So I'm going to talk to you today and next weekend about this whole idea of how do we become more respectful because our families need this. This is a part of the, the oil, the lubricant of a family and it causes a family to work well and appropriately. I'm only going to cover two things with you today. And so you, part two of this will be next week. But I want you to be back for that as I cover these two things for this weekend. Here's the first thing that's, fine, that, that's a primary principle for us. Respect for others, which we know that we're called to, right? Right? You guys alive out there today? Okay. We know we're called to respect other people. So respect for others, where does it begin? It begins with respect for who? For God and for His Word. I just want to make this very clear. If you don't learn to respect God, you'll never learn how to respect other people. Because respect for God gives you the capacity, the ability the strength and the power to respect other people. Part of what's happened in our world today, as I mentioned a moment ago, our world has become very rude. And part of the reason that our world, I believe, is so rude and disrespectful is because we've pushed God out of our world. Amen. We push God out of our culture. We don't want God to be involved in culture anymore. The culture at large is 
pushed him away. And because of that, we suffer. Going back historically with this nation, our nation was established and founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And we at least, whether people loved God or served God, there was an acknowledgement at some level of the moral virtues and values of the Judeo-Christian ethic. And so that provided for many, many decades some aspect of, of respect in our culture. But the more you push God out of the culture, the more respect goes out of the culture very clear. So respect for other people begins with respect for God and respect for His words. So I'm going to take a moment today and talk to you about four things that God respects. Because if we understand what God respects, then we begin to understand what we are to respect. So what does God respect? Because our respect for one another starts with them. I'll give you four things. Number one, God respects human life. This is where it starts with God. He's the author of life. He respects life. He respects your life. Your life is a gift from God. Your life, let me say it again. Your, the very fact that you're a living, breathing entity is a gift from Almighty God. Your life is a gift from God. Life is precious to God and pr- life should be precious to us as well. God respects life. How do we know this? Genesis chapter 1. I've told you many times. My goal here is to be a Bible teacher for you. Okay, To teach you what Scripture says. Genesis 1, 27. So God, what did He do? Created. What did He create? He created many things, but in this passage, mankind. That's us. Humanity. Of all the creation of God in Genesis chapter 1, this is the only description of creation that includes the next phrase. So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. There's something unique about humanity. Because we bear in our human nature and our human capacities, we bear the image of God. Now that image has been tarnished, obviously, by the fact that we fall and pray to sin. We understand that. But there's a stamp of the nature image of God upon humanity. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The psalmist David, reflecting on his own life in Psalm 139, describes the beauty of human life. He's speaking to God here, the psalmist David is, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together where? In my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter utter seclusion. I was woven together in the dark of the Womb. So he's describing from the conception forward, God saw him and knew him and had plans for his life. He goes on to say, you saw me before I was born, not just after I was born, but before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. So the psalmist said, thank you, Lord, for creating me. I am a gift from God. And these great Ten Commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai, as he's establishing his nation, the nation of Israel, all the ten things that he's going to describe, only ten things he's going to say as he begins to constitute his nation. One of those ten things you find in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. Why? Because God holds life very precious. Isaiah 44, I'm just laying out passages for you. This is what the Lord says. So who's talking here? God is. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer. Notice this. Who formed you where? In the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself. And one of the greatest evangelistic salvation passages in all the Bible, one simple verse. Would you read it together with me? 
You know it, I'm sure, but let's all read together. For God, let's read aloud and loudly. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God so loved humanity. He so loved, and as I've told you before, you can just put your name right there. What is your name? Whatever your name is, put it right there. God so loved you that he gave his one and only Son. That's how much he loves humanity. It's how much he loves you and me. So God respects life. Number two, God respects, number two, your will. God made you a free moral agent. You are not a puppet. When God created you, he gave the capacity to choose what you're going to do with life. You're going to choose to obey him or disobey him. We are not automatically just people that follow God. We have to choose to follow him. And we're held accountable for our choices in life. Because why? We're free. We're free to make choices as to how we're going to live our lives. One of the greatest gifts that God has given us as human beings is our will. Our capacity to choose what we're going to do. And then be held accountable to God for the choices that we make. If God honors life, you and I should honor life. And if God honors the will, you and I should honor will. That means I'm not in control of anybody else. I should never try to control somebody, okay? In any relationship, it's not my job to control my wife. It's not her job to control me. It's my job to teach and train my children. But once they grow up and head out on their own, it's not my job to control them. They get to choose what they're going to do with their lives, okay? And so, why? Because every person has a will. We're free moral agents. Genesis chapter 2 tells us this. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free. To eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely or certainly die. God says, you can do whatever you want to do, Adam. I put you in this garden. You can make the choice that you're going to make. I'm giving you a commandment. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But you've got the choice. And just know that if you choose to eat of that tree, there will be a consequence. And the consequence will be the fact that there will be spiritual death that you will experience. So we're free. Deuteronomy chapter 30, as Moses is preparing the children of Israel to head into the promised land, he says, today I've given you the choice between life and death. You get to choose between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. So we're talking about honoring, respecting God. And we can only respect God if we know what God respects. And what does God respect? He respects life. He respects your will. He never forces anything on you. God only comes into your world by invitation. He will never force his way into your life. He waits for you to invite him. Now, if you invite him in and give him control of your life, he'll take control, but he's waiting for that. Here's the third thing I want to talk about. God respects your unique potential. Every person here has a unique potential about you that God placed in you. You're different from everybody else. And there are uniquenesses to your gifts and your abilities that came from God Almighty to you. And he wants you to discover and to fulfill your highest and best giftings and run the race that he designed you to run. He didn't design you to run somebody else's race. He wants you to run your race. Amen? Okay. So everybody's gifted here. Now, I could talk for a long time about giftings and how they're confirmed and affirmed in our lives. We don't necessarily choose our own. We don't identify our own giftings. It's often identified by our circumstances in life, by people that affirm them and so forth. There's a whole aspect of teaching on that. But what I want to say to you today is that every person is gifted by God for something and with something, a gift from Almighty God. And God honors and respects the fact that he puts something in you to do something with in your life. I should have gotten a little amen right there, okay? He puts something in you so you'll do something with it in your life. He puts something there so that you have something to contribute to the world around you. The prophet uh, Jeremiah observed this in his own life. He says, the Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, there you see that again. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Peter the apostle refers to this as well. God has given how many folks? Each of you, what? A gift 
from him, from his great variety of spiritual gifts, use them well to serve one another. So what does God respect? God respects life. God respects a person's will. You get to choose what you're going to do with your life. God respects the fact that he put in you something that he valued, a gift that he's given to you. And then the fourth thing, I told you there are four of them. Here's the fourth thing. God respects people who respect and follow him. That when you and I choose to respect and follow God, God then responds with respect toward us. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, we see this principle laid out. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and that of Aaron, your father, would walk in priestly service before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Please notice this next statement. For those who honor me, I will honor. God says, if you honor me, what will I do? I will honor you. And those who despise me will be insignificant and contemptible. God very clearly says, if you honor me, I will honor you. There's, if you respect me, you will receive respect in return from me. Is this a principle in Scripture? Jesus reiterated it in John chapter 12. Look at what he said. Those who serve me must follow me. My servants will be with me wherever I will be. If, read it with me, if people serve me, the Father will honor them. So very clearly we see God respects life, so we should respect life. Amen? God respects our will, the fact that we get to choose what we're going to do with our lives and the consequences that come accordingly, so we should honor that. We should respect that. God respects the fact that we actually have been given gifts and capacities by God. So we should respect that as well. Every person has received a gift from God, and God has respects the fact that when we follow him, he then returns in respect and honor to us. Let's go to the second point for today, looking at respect. Respect is something given, and respect is something earned. Draw your attention to those two words. Respect is something that you give and respect is something that you earn. When it comes to relationships in life, you give respect. There's a giving side and there's an earning side. We're always called to give respect to other people. There's never a time that you should be disrespectful to anyone. As a Christian believer and follower of Christ, there should never be a time that you and I are disrespectful to anyone. Even if they're disrespectful to us, it doesn't matter. We need to be respectful to them. I'm going to read you some passages in a moment that that help us to understand this. But then we're also responsible to seek to earn the respect of other people. Now, please understand something. Just because you seek to earn the respect of someone, you can't expect that they're going to give it to you. Are you with me? You can do your best to try to earn the respect of people, but it doesn't automatically mean that you are going to earn it. You can't expect it. If you expect people to respect you, you're going to be really offended most of your life. You'll be frustrated and offended because there are going to be a lot of people that you're going to encounter in life. You'll do your best to try to earn their respect, and they're still not going to respect you because they don't have a center of respect inside of them. So you've got to understand that it's my job to give respect and it's my job to earn respect even if someone doesn't seem worthy of that respect or even if they don't return it to me. That's not my business. My business is to give it and my business is to seek to earn it. Look at some scriptures here. 1 Peter 2 verse 12. Be careful to live how? Properly, be careful to live properly, pro- properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Now, obviously, if it relates to unbelieving neighbors, neighbors, it should relate to our families as well, correct? Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior, your respectful behavior, and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Titus chapter 2, verse 1, Paul instructs Titus with these words, as for you, Titus, promote this kind of living, 
that reflects wholesome teaching. He says, I've given you a lot of wholesome teaching. Now I want you to apply it by the way that you live. I want you to show the world around you that this teaching is real in your life. So I'm going to talk to you about how to live a respectful life. How do you become a respected how do you become a respected person potentially? Now, the 10 things I'm about to give you, I'm going to go through them very quickly. So you need to buckle your seatbelt right now because we're going to run through these 10 things really quickly. These are just a quick list of 10 things that you can do to earn the respect of others. But even if you do these 10, ten things, it doesn't guarantee that people are going to respect you. You got that point? Amen. If you don't do these 10 things, I can guarantee you they're not going to respect you, okay? I guarantee you that, okay? But if you do these 10 things, you have a great possibility of earning the respect of other people, especially in your family. And this is where we're starting at in your family life. Here we go. You got your seatbelts on? Number one, you got to be honest and sincere as a person. If you're a liar and a cheater, don't expect to be respected, okay? If, that, if, you, if you're constantly twisting the truth and constantly telling lies and deceiving people and manipulating people, guess what? People aren't going to ever respect you. Amen. I don't care what you do. You'll never be respected by anyone. Okay. Anyone that gets to know you will stop respecting you as soon as they realize that's not an honest, sincere person. Okay. And so you want, especially in your family, be known as a person. This is another word for this. As you have integrity. Integrity doesn't mean perfection in your life. It means that you're seeking perfection. You're honest about where you are. You're honest about your weaknesses, honest about your failures, as we'll talk about in a moment, and you're sincere in the way that you're going after God, going after life. And so you need to, especially in your family, that's where it starts, to be honest and sincere there. Number two, second thing, you need to do what you promise. That's another aspect of integrity. That if you promise something, you do it. Why? Because you earn respect by doing what you promise. Okay. Husbands, if you promise your wife something, do it. Wives, if you promise your husband something, do it. Kids, if you promise your parents something, do it. I'm going to make up my bed. Make it up, okay? <laughs> parents, if you promise your kids something, do it. Now, there are going to be times in life that you'll not fulfill, be able to fulfill every promise. If you know that you can't, you've made a promise you can't fulfill, at least tell them about it. At least go to them and say, hey, honey, I made this promise to you, but this has changed, and can we make an adjustment to it? I realized at the time things were different than they are now, and so you have conversations, but make sure you do what you promise. Why? Because that builds respect. Okay. Number three, admit your mistakes and failures. When you mess up, say so. Okay. Don't wait for somebody to have to tell you that you've messed up. No, just be honest about the fact, I blew it. The hardest words that most people have in their vocabulary, and some do not even have it in their vocabulary, are the words, please forgive me, I'm sorry, I was wrong. They have no way of saying that. In fact, for some of you here, you haven't said that in three decades. Okay. Does that mean you've been perfect for three decades? No, it says you're too proud to admit when you make a mistake. If you're too proud to admit when you make a mistake, then you're living in an unreal world because the real world, everybody makes mistakes. And so when you make a mistake, you own up to it. And what does that do? That earns you the respect of other people. It doesn't diminish your respect. It actually earns respect when you say, you know what, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Please forgive me. One of the, some of the most powerful words you can ever say. The next thing is work hard. Why? Because if you're lazy, you'll never be respected. Okay. If you don't take your responsibilities seriously, You don't invest in the things, the opportunities that have been given to you. If you're not putting your best foot forward in all those opportunities God has given you in life, you'll never be respected in the way that you could be. And it's especially true in the family that whatever your responsibilities are, put your best effort at it. Don't say, you know what, if I get a C, it's all right. No, don't go for the C and don't go for the B and don't even go for the A. Go for the A plus in everything that you do. Give your best as you're doing it unto the Lord. Okay. Amen? And then here's the next thing. Be teachable. Our world is full of know-it-alls. And some of them are 20 years old. 
And they think they know everything, okay? And I'm older than 20. I know that some of you would not have guessed that, but I am a little older than 20, okay? And the older I've gotten in life, the more I realize how much I don't know, okay? I've, actually, I feel like I've gotten dumber the older I've gotten. How about you, okay? It's like, there's a whole lot of stuff I thought I used to know that I don't think I know anymore because I, I've made mistakes along the way, things I regret, I wish I'd done better, and all, the, all of us have those moments of reflecting back and realizing how foolish we've been and how much still we still need to know and understand. So be teachable. There's always something that you can learn in your life. If you're not a, the best husband, buy a book, go to a class, and learn how to be a better husband. Amen? If you're not the best wife in the world, buy a book, go to a class, learn how to be a better wife. If you're not a great parent, buy a book, go to a class, learn how to be a better parent. If you're not a great child, we'll pray for you, okay? (laughs) Okay, okay. And a few other things. To be teachable, okay? And then out of being teachable, you need to demonstrate growth. All your life, be a growing person and demonstrate the fact that you're, you're different today than you were yesterday. You're growing. Some of you haven't changed in 30 years, okay? Amen. Best God, I'm never going to change. Well, <laughs> we noticed, okay? <laughs> it's very noticeable, okay? But be a person that's changing, that is maturing, that is growing. Why? Because that makes people respect you, okay? That's the potential of respect. And then number seven, we're going through these quickly. Give more than you take. Amen? Some people are like vacuum cleaners. They show up in your world and suck everything out of it. You hear them coming. You hear it all the way down the pathway. Here they come. I know that's brother and sister sucker. Okay? They're coming after me. Okay? Brother and sister vacuum cleaner. They're coming right now. Suck the life out of me again. Do you respect people like that? No, okay? You don't respect people like that. You respect people that are water fountains, right? You come up to them and they have something to give. It doesn't mean that you don't take from time to time. We all need to receive from one another. We understand that. But you want to be a person who's always giving more than you're taking, that you're contributing more than you're consuming, okay? That you're, you're adding value. Number eight, be considerate, okay? Be considerate. To be considerate means you think before you do stuff and you think about what, what the impact is going to be on someone else. When you're a considerate person, hold the door for someone instead of rushing out yourself first. That's called being considerate. You know, people respect people like that. Do things that communicate the fact that I'm thinking about you. That's what consideration means. I'm actually thinking about the impact of this on your life or how I can be a blessing to you. And then number nine, here we go. Two more here. Help other people succeed. You know, most of us wear a jersey. It's our favorite team. You know what's on that jersey? Me. We got our me jersey. We wear our me jersey everywhere. Can I just encourage you to exchange your me jersey and start wearing somebody else's jersey, okay? Pull for somebody else. Now, that doesn't mean you become unimportant. You still have important things in your life that you're pursuing and so forth. Nothing wrong with that. But in the process of you seeking success in your life, take somebody with you on the journey. Help somebody else succeed. Be a fan of somebody else. Husbands, be a fan of your wife. And wives, be a fan of your husband. And parents, be a fan of your children. And friends, be a fan of one another. Family members, be a fan of each other. Why? Because we need that encouragement that comes from people that are encouraging us along in the process of success in life. And here's the final one. I save the best one for last, okay? And it is so good that I know that you, you're going to want to read this one with me because this is the best one. And so here we go with the final one together. Read it aloud and loudly with me. Here we go. Control your mind and your mouth, okay? I've got a great suggestion for you. If you want to be more respected, go buy a year's supply of duct tape. (laughs) And apply generous amounts over your lips every day. And only loose the duct tape when you have something meaningful to say. You'll be surprised how seldom you have to remove the duct tape. So many times we just diminish our respect right out of this mouth, right? We have attitudes toward people and they come out in our our words. And because we don't control that, we diminish our respect with other people. 
because of what we say and how we say what we say to others. I'm going to talk more about this in this, this series because obviously it's a very important topic. But make the choice to say, you know, I've got to, put, I've got to get some controls in my life in this regard. Now, I'll remind you of something. You can do all 10 of these things and do them well, A+, plus, and some people are still not going to respect you. Are you hearing me today? These 10 things do not guarantee that you're going to walk out of here and be the most respected person in the world. There's still going to be people that will not treat you with respect. That's okay. okay? Because you're not responsible for them. Isn't that great to know? People can treat you whatever way they want to treat you and, and, and their, in, in regard to how they want to live their lives. It doesn't have to affect you because you've made a choice of how you're going to live your life. And if they don't respect you, that's their choice. And by the way, please remember something. When everything is said and done, even if, you haven't, if you've done the right thing in your life, and even though you don't have respect now, the books will be balanced one day. Amen? Okay? The books will be balanced one day. Okay? This is the thing to remember. And this is why... It's not worth it to get all angry and bitter at people and frustrated at people because we as Christians realize that this life is not all there is. There are books being kept in heaven, okay? And there's a righteous judge in heaven who's paying attention to justice and issues of that nature. And when we're treated the wrong way and if we still respond the right way in our lives, then God sees that and takes note, takes note of that. And we can be assured even if, it, if that doesn't get settled here on earth, it will be settled in eternity. Because some things, some things in life are not just as fair as we would like them to be on earth. But I promise you there's a fair and just God in heaven. Amen? A fair and just God in heaven. Let me conclude with two final passages as we're being done today, okay? Because I want you to see that all of this is not about somebody else. It's about you and me. I'm going to leave the responsibility with you and me today. But keep the Lord Christ holy where? In whose heart? Not somebody else's heart, but where? In your hearts. Always be ready to answer everyone who asks you to explain about the hope you have. So there's hope in you. But answer them in a gentle way with respect. Keep whose conscience clear? Your. So live in a way that you are always seeking to do the right thing in your life. Keep your conscience clear. Then people will see the good way you live as followers of Christ. And those who say bad things about you will be ashamed of what they, they said. So you want to live in such a way so that your behavior actually shames people who are saying bad things about you, okay? The purpose is not to shame them, but the reality is your behavior ends up being a statement of your righteousness compared to their attitudes toward you. Luke chapter 6, final passage here. Again, we're talking about our responsibility. If you love, now remember I talked about love, that was the first passage I gave you today, and one of the key elements of love is respect, right? Right? Okay. So, I think it's appropriate here if we can insert that word. If you love, respect only those who love or respect you. Why should you get credit for that? He's implying you shouldn't. Even sinners love or respect those who love or respect them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get any credit? Even sinners do that much. Jesus says people of the world can love and respect those who respect them. But the challenge that we have as believers is loving and respecting people who, know, who do, not, do not necessarily love and respect us. But that's the challenge that we have, and that's the calling that we have. And the first place to practice it is at home. Think about home being the practice zone for how you will treat the world around you. If you can't do it at home, you'll not be very good long-term doing it anywhere else. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me as we pray today? Father, we thank you for your word today. We're so grateful that we've had this time to study. Lord, I pray that something that's been said today would, would take root in our hearts, that we would have heard your word in a way that will stir some things up inside of us, will challenge us, and Lord, at the end of the day, that it would change us, it would help us to be more like you. So God, we commit your word to our hearts, bring fruit out of it for your glory, we ask in Christ's name. 
our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and I ask no one be looking around or moving about for the next few moments, very quiet, very still. This is the most important part of today's service because there are people in this room that you've never given your life to Jesus. And all that I've talked about today is not possible without power inside of you, spiritual, supernatural power that comes from a relationship with Jesus. And if you've never invited Christ into your life, you can do it right now. All you have to do is sincerely pray this prayer with me and mean it again from your heart. This can be your moment of receiving him in your life. Would you pray with me? Just whisper these words. Say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm so sorry for everything I've done wrong. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're God's son, the Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you're alive. Jesus, I believe in you. I pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life right now. Forgive me for all of my sins. I turn my life over to you. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for those today that have prayed that prayer. I thank you for hearing them. And I pray you'll help them to grow in you and follow you and serve you faithfully from these day, this, this day forward. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's welcome some people to God's family today. Fantastic. If you prayed with me that prayer to give your life to Jesus, we want to give you a copy of this little book. It's called A New You. And it's our gift to you. And if you look around the worship center, you'll see that there's people holding this book up. As soon as the service is over, find your way to that person closest to you that has this book in their hand and say, hey, I prayed with the pastor. They'll give you a copy of it to help you get started in your relationship with Jesus. If you're new today, if it's your first time, we'd love to say hi to you. We have a meet and greet that happens to my right. Uh, just head right to that direction at the end of the service. I have a gift for you over there. And we'd love to meet you and say hi to you before you head out today. Thank you for coming to church. Stand to your feet, if you will, as we get ready to head into a brand new week. And I'd like to remind you that this moment in the service, I'm going to give you a blessing. And I believe and know the Bible teaches the power of blessing. But a blessing has to be received. So would you put yourself in a position of receiving this blessing upon your life as you get ready to head into a brand new week. Now may God Almighty, the God of great strength and power, May He fill you with grace and the power of His Spirit. May you walk this week with amazing favor. May doors open for you this week that you will know only God could have done that. And may you find this week that indeed you have a friend that is closer than a brother and His name is Jesus. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Have a blessed week in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>